Welcome back. I've missed you. When painting or drawing, have you ever looked at your coloring and thought, well, that could really use some work? <laughs> but without really knowing what exactly. Well, in this week's festive YouTube article class, we'll go over six coloring mistakes that I see artists make all the time and more importantly, how to fix them and get amazing results. Oh yeah, class is starting. We're gonna be like... All right, class is in session. Pay attention, coloring is hard. Whether it's choosing the right amount of contrast for a painting, or what process to even use for coloring, or why your characters look flat. <laughs> As a teacher, I see the mistakes I'll highlight in today's class all the time. Let's fix that once and for all and level up your coloring game significantly after you've paid the class fee of either one like or one sub. Mm -hmm. That's better. All right, let's get started. Ah! The first coloring mistake to avoid is to ignore the power of gradient maps. Everyone should try them. I guarantee most of you will fall in love once you give them a shot. This will work the same in both Photoshop and Clip Studio Paint. Let me explain their full power. Get it? <laughs> let's say you have a drawing that you like that you decide to shade and color. The shading is done, but what? do for the colors. We can then use flat colors and set the layer to the multiply blend mode to see the shading through it, but that still looks sad at best. You could tint that grayscale a bit for better results and try to go back and forth between the flats and the shading layer to get a combination that looks okay. Or you could slap a gradient map on top of that whole thing and do everything through that. This way we can control both the shadow color, the highlight colors, and anything in between. Even better, if you've been playing with this a little bit, you might have a bunch of gradients already saved that you can just use right away. It's so easy to get different variants and so easy to tweak them if needed. This controls everything. No need to ever go back to the layers underneath. And then later, if ever needed, you can go back to your gradients whenever you need to for maximum flexibility. Now to that, we just need a bit of highlights and um, boom, I'm done. Gradient maps are awesome. It's a mistake not to give them a go. The next mistake then is to overcomplicate your coloring process. And actually, before I show you the simplest coloring method ever, I need to mention the mega sale that I have going on for the holidays. Until the end of the month, you'll be able to get my complete art education program at a huge discount. Actually, everything else in my Keybrush store too. The holiday break, if you have any, is the perfect time to start your art journey the best way possible. Use the link in the video description to check out the program and there's still some time left. Join us, over 13 a thousand students strong and growing. All right, back to the simple coloring process that I mentioned. Unless you're very experienced, the one thing that will slow you down the most while coloring a drawing is going to be your process or your lack of process, I guess. Juggling hundreds of layers and not really having clear steps in mind will waste you hours. Instead, try this. Line art first, then add the shading on top or simply replace the line art with the shading layer all together like I do. Now, on top of that, we add the flats set to the multiply blend mode. From here, of course, you could use gradient maps like I just mentioned, but it also works without. So let's just move on to the lights layer. One for each light source. I have my key light here. This layer is set to the overlay blend mode. My rim light next set to hard light. That one says I wanted something a little bit more intense. Both blend modes can work just depending on the situation. Finally, I add a highlights layer set also to the hard light blend mode where I'll typically add makeup and material highlights, subtle stuff. In the end, we have like five to six layer stops and a fully colored drawing. Can't be that bro, as simple as it gets, no clutter, no guessing what's next, maximum efficiency. Clean up your process. Now, the next coloring mistake to avoid is to ignore atmospheric perspective or the loss of contrast in colors with depth. Maybe you're familiar with the idea. Things that are far into the distance usually tend to look lighter. And well, you can use this effect in most paintings to push the level of depth. These paintings work well because the foreground and the backgrounds both have different levels of contrast more contrast and saturation in the foreground and less so in the background. If I jump to my forest here though, it has a bunch of layers, but right now they all share similar levels of contrast and saturation. There's no atmospheric perspective effect here. And as a result, I'm sure you'll agree this looks pretty flat. It looks messy too, since it's hard to tell what's what. 
When I start to desaturate each plane though, more so in the background and less so in the foreground, we get this nice sense of depth we were missing before. Ah, that's the atmospheric perspective at work. It also works for slightly smaller scales, like this sleeping robot looks massive because I used atmospheric perspective. The contrast is much higher around the hands than it is around her head further back in the scene. You wouldn't notice this effect on a smaller scale though, so use atmospheric perspective wisely. It's your friend to add depth to your painting. The fourth coloring mistake to avoid is using too much or too little contrast. Usually when I give feedback to my students, the issue will be too much of it, but sometimes it's the opposite. When you have too much contrast, like in this painting here, it'll simply be as a result of a lack of midtones. When the painting predominantly uses white and black values, it produces a level of contrast that's not pleasant to look at. It's too aggressive. An ideal amount of contrast, like in this painting, We'll use the full range of values from full black to the midtones all the way to pure white. And you can always tell by bringing up the levels panel with Ctrl L in Photoshop. If you can see like a mountain shape in a graph, you're probably all good, like in this case. In our first case though, the mountain is not complete. It's only half a mountain and that's not good because as you can see, most of what we have are very dark values and barely anything else. Add in some midtones though and our graph looks a lot better. We have a peak now. That's what we want. And then also on the flip side, if you don't have enough contrast, the spread won't use the full width of the graph. That's how we can easily tell if you're not sure just by looking at it. Contrast is good in moderate quantities. Not too much, not too little. So don't hesitate to use the levels tool to double check when you're not sure. The fifth coloring mistake to avoid is going to be a quick one. Stop using neutral grays for your backgrounds. I see so many character designs, character drawings that are presented with a simple gray background. Stop it! If you're gonna use gray, at least use a very light or a very dark gray. That's already much better. But preferably, you'd probably want to use a complementary color to the overall color of your character to help make it pop as much as possible. My character here is mostly yellow slash green, so a bluish purplish background should contrast nicely against it. It's opposite on the chromatic circle. Like we just talked about when it comes to atmospheric perspective, the backgrounds should be less saturated than the foreground, aka my character in this case. Not only does this help make the character pop more, but now we also have a common complementary color harmony between the character and the background, a green and purple complementary color harmony. Win, win. Stop using mid gray for your backgrounds, Although mid gray would work great while you're coloring as a temporary color since it's neutral. Just make sure to get rid of it as soon as you're done. Anyways, moving on to the final coloring mistake, not using the unknown power of material diversity. What is that? For context, the human eye gets excited with contrasts, all types of contrasts. Contrast in values, in saturation, in color, like with cool and warm colors, but also by contrast in materials. It's much more interesting to see a painting that features many types of materials than one where all the materials look the same, as I noticed is too often the case, like this. The more variety, the better. More simply though, just have things that are shiny next to things that aren't. The most significant difference between materials will usually be their reflectiveness, how matte versus how reflective something is. If something is meant to be a hard material, it'll probably be more reflective, more shiny, and vice versa. Add highlights with that in mind. I'm sure you'll agree that this looks more eye-catching with the reflections on the doll's limbs, right? Without, not so much. And this idea is what I had in mind too when I added the glass bottle in here and the subtle reflections on the table next to the books. Use more material variety when you color your drawings or when you paint. It's much more appealing. And uh, that's gonna wrap it up for this week's class. I hope it helped. Let me know if it did in the comments. I read them all as usual. And by the way, I made these paintings using brushes from my two custom brush sets, one of which you can download for free with the link in the video description. If you're still here, you deserve it for being a good student. I'm proud of you. Merry Christmas, and make sure that you come back next week for another YouTube art school class. Ah!